And what I want to talk about today is how algorithms and things are changing and how that's affecting hardware as well. So I just want to step through that. Let me give you a little bit of a history of myself as well. I want to talk about these guys piece by piece and see how we're changing this stack of what I consider very important people in terms of algorithms, software development and computers. Is that any better? Thank you, London. Right. Uh, so this is about me and my friends as well. My friends here you may recognize as being uh, slightly uh, robotic. I do have some real friends as well, but these are my real friends that I play with a lot. So I'm into helping these and working with these. And I want to talk about this, which is how hardware is speeding up, how processing itself is becoming more and more important. And I also want to talk about power and how we manage that. Um, for me, it all started in my childhood. I don't know if anyone else had one of these when they were younger. They're probably still available in various different forms. This is very similar to one that I had. It's not, ex not identical. It's actually quite difficult to find the one that I had on the internet or pictures thereof. I certainly don't own it anymore. But it was a great little device. I could hook up my little electronic circuits and that really got me into looking at electronics from an early age. Likewise, I mean, we didn't have the internet at this point in time. We had magazines that you'd buy from the local stationers, WH Smiths, etc. Uh, this was a fairly entry level one called Everyday Electronics. Um, I'd say they were kind of fairly entry level, easy to start with projects. Um, but as we move through, um, we go up into more complex magazines. This was the Lector, very popular uh, electronics construction magazine. And this is how the information was shared at this point in time in terms of example circuits, projects. They'd offer kits out that you could uh, buy on, on through the post, etc., to follow up with the projects that they cover in their magazines. And then getting me further and further into, you know, the kind of higher echelons of magazines of this day were things like the Wireless World, where it really did get quite, quite complicated in terms of the electronics. Um, I also try to make things myself. Uh, this isn't one of my projects. Um, mine would probably have been a lot worse at this point in time. Uh, it was also very difficult to actually construct, so we used to have to make do with all kinds of uh, pins in wood boards, Vero boards, strip boards, etc. Uh, PCBs weren't particularly accessible at that point, um, but you did learn to make your own as well. Um, and then all of a sudden, I discovered this little puppy. Um, this has a Z80 in it, and this completely changed my view. Uh, I moved on from just being interested in electronics to actually being interested in computing and algorithms, and in particular in assembly code, etc. Getting into that then led me into these quite famous and well-known chips. You've got a 6809 here, a 6502, a Zilog Z80. Um, I went through quite a few different ones of these. In the early days, you had to understand the instructions on how to program these because you were very much confined to things like he hex editing and or writing out machine code that got loaded via a basic command, etc. Um, in order to get around this, I had to understand this, which is basically the von Neumann architecture. Uh, and this is pretty much how every computer is today in one shape or form. There are variations on it, but this is the recipe, if you like, that has been uh, taken to its logical extreme, as I will point out shortly. And there's the man himself. Um, and I had to learn all this stuff. In these days, we had to write it in notebooks and things. We couldn't actually do it on screens. We didn't have computers that were capable of doing that in many cases. So we had to write it in square notebooks, etc. And then later, if, if we were lucky, we'd get a hex keyboard like this where we could enter the codes in directly to actually program things. And then, ooh, you know, a bit later on, dot matrix printing as well. So we could actually print out uh, our listings of assembly for you know, keeping for all, all long purposes, etc., rather than having to rely on writing them out by hand. Um, and then this, this, for example, is the Apple II. 
So at this point, we're getting into having screens and being able to edit machine code on the fly, do assembly code on the, on the screens itself, and save them back to disks, etc. But I was still very much into the electronics, and into the digital electronics in particular. So I was still thinking a lot in terms of logic gates, Boolean, algebra, etc. cetera. Uh, and this guy who I showed you at the front, at the front in 1957, he created something called the perceptron. Has anyone heard of the perceptron? Okay, few people. Uh, he was a little before his time. What the perceptron does is really emulates the basic operation of a neuron. Uh, it was a very rough and ready uh, model, electronic model, that he built in order to do this. And that was in 1957. When I was at college, uh, at university in Kingston, uh, I came across this in a bookshop, which fascinated me. And this is about parallel distributed processing. Now, in that day and age, that didn't mean lots and lots of computers working in parallel. Uh, what they were talking about in this book is different ways of computing based on natural algorithms, neural networks, perceptrons, and all sorts of different things. And it was a fascinating book. Uh, and I, I did wonder whether I could combine these disciplines in some way at this point. I did spend some time researching on it. Um, but I had trouble getting hold of the technology I needed to actually make any sense of this, other than building just a very small number of neurons or perceptrons. And then suddenly this happened, the 68,000. That made this possible. If anyone, does anyone recognize the name of that machine? That's right. That was the predecessor to the Apple Macs. Uh, it had a cast iron base. It weighed a ton. Um, but th this is what actually preceded the small um, Mac Pluses, which became the more popular graphical user interface uh, products from Apple. Um, that got me into using things like Pascal. Um, we had to learn that at college. That was the high-level language that we had to learn along with assembly and machine codes. I was a bit disappointed. I really wanted to learn C at this point. Um, and then... The big change was the 8086, the 808, 186, the 286, 386, et cetera. That happened, creating these. And then things started getting really, really uh, prolific. I actually had one of these temporarily from work and used this to do some programming. I did revisit my parallel distributed processing in those days on a 55SX. Um, doing some basic perceptrons. And again, I had a, maybe a few hundred neurons. But again, uh, not much was happening. It was taking an awful long time to do anything with these things. Uh, in particular, you had a coprocessor that you needed to add to the 55SX, which I couldn't afford. And then there was this AI winter. I couldn't find any good snowy pictures, by the way, so we'll, we'll just take the white. And the bottom dropped out of AI in terms of interest. People stopped working on it, funded stop, funding stopped coming through, etc. And it kind of got lost for a while. And at the same time, this was happening. Anyone recognize this very early version of Windows? Um, at this point, I ended up working with companies producing graphics cards, etc. Uh, and you'd see that on one screen. On the other screen, you'd see DOS, which was where you'd be controlling this from. Um, which got me into these, which are graphics cards. I'm working with companies producing these on the electronics and the software side. Meanwhile, the internet happened with lots of data centers, racks of computers started emerging, and because we ran out of megahertz, um, things began to go parallel rather than just faster and faster. At that point, I moved into Lambda Calculus and Pi Calculus, learning languages such as Erlang, etc. cetera. Uh, the number of processors grew. Um, here we're showing some examples from Adaptiva, uh, the Parallela type products. Um, I then got into using, in hardware, the XMOS chips, which are parallel cord uh, chips. On the right there, we've got the Parallela, which is a 16-core 
uh, embedded machine. And anyone recognize what's on the bottom? That's a bit from the past. That's right, it's a transputer. I always wanted to work on those and never had a chance. I was working in graphics at the time. Couldn't get near one. Um, the, the main man who created that and the Occam language, David May, also created the uh, XMOS chip in conjunction with one of his PhD students uh, out of Bristol. Meanwhile, because of this, um, the perception re-emerged and it got used in neural networks in more sophisticated versions and it's made a real comeback. Uh, these examples are showing convolution neural networks which are very good for processing, categorizing uh, images for example. So a lot of the image work you see if you do an image search, that kind of thing on Google, it will be based on categorization, machine categorization using convolution networks and neural networks. Um, and remember these guys? Well, they've grown up into this kind of thing. That's a Titan, which was up until last year pretty much the state of the art in terms of graphic, uh, sorry, GPUs. Very high performance mathematical floating point calculating on a board. That in turn this year has turned into Pascal. Um, and there are literally thousands of these GPU cores all working in parallel in order to crunch numbers. And that's the kind of thing that you need if you want to train a large neural network. Uh, certainly with the likes of Google, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft, they're all spending a lot of time crunching neural networks, training neural networks for Im processing images, conversations, etc. Uh, they're using them to train these neural networks and convolutions. But we're all still dancing to that old Van Neumann tune. In essence, they are the same thing. They are all multiple versions of this. Um, and that took me back to my work on PDP. And in thinking how I would use these developments to uh, produce robotics at lower cost and make them accessible. Um, to make them smart, I also need to put artificial intelligence into uh, embedded hardware as well. However, we're not going to be cramming any Krays and XC30s into robots anytime soon. We're going to have to find some other way of doing that. Um, so we don't have the power envelope for these type of things. What we need is a kind of brain chips, for want of a better term. And that's what really took me back away from John Van Neumann and looking back at Alan Turing's work and looking back at basic Turing machines um, there's an example there of the diagram of a Turing machine reshuffling the pack making Turing and Rosenblatt's work more important and re-looking at the energy envelopes that are required so what I envisage will probably happen if we can imagine on this first curve here is the von Neumann architectures. What we will probably see is these new architectures emerging for processing these very large amounts of data when it comes to neural network. Not just training the neural networks, but actually inference machines. That's the machines that actually run the neural networks. You know, it might be running the actual uh, intelligent car, driving the cars automatically, for example. Um, the problem we have is the amount of power per neuron. If you're using Van Neumann architectures in order to train and infer your networks, you need enormous amounts of power. In order to get it down to something similar, if we look at this uh, particularly good computer that we have inside here, um, this is a kind of two watt device, and per neuron we're down in picojoules of energy. So that's where we've kind of got to get down to in terms of processing in order to make these things embedded, portable, and to run off batteries, etc and be properly used in um, robotics environments. And that's what this new S-curve is about. So what you will see a lot of is the old von Neumann architectures and some of these new techno technologies being used together in combination. Um, hybrids, if you like. If you look at what people like uh, Intel are doing right now, their next generations of Xeons will actually include their ulterior FPGAs from their acquisition 
So that you've got reprogrammable parallel cells in there that can accelerate specific functions such as training neural networks, inferring neural networks, etc. And you'll see this in servers, and there will be work, you know, similar work from people like IBM, etc. as well, um, and Xilinx. Which means new building blocks, really. Uh, the old algorithms aren't going to work in the same way. We have to work at a different level. We have to break problems down differently. Anyone that's done any AI work using neural networks will find it uh, a slightly different exercise. It's a bit more mathematical. So one of the new tools um, that I'm going to talk about here is, um, this is an example of Verilog, uh, which is a language that we can use to actually program logic to actually create chips and uh, very fast parallel uh, components. On the FPGA side, what's changed for me is this chap, Clifford Wolf, um, has developed, he, he announced in September, he, he developed his, his iStorm uh, collection of tools, which was the first open source uh, re-engineering of an FPGA bitstream as well as a uh, Verilog HTL toolchain. And that really changes uh, the playing field. That's the first time we've ever had that. Before you would have to download the tools that come with the FPGA vendor. So if you were using say a Xilinx FPGA you would have to download literally hundreds of gigabytes of uh, their development tools. It, it's it, they, they are huge. Uh, so what does this open stack consist of? Well, Yosis is the piece that will take your Verilog and convert it into a hardware description language, a HDL. So it takes that algorithmic, algorithmic code and it actually produces a HDL output that can then be placed and routed into the FPGA fabric itself, into the chip. Uh, as it says there, Project iStorm aims to document the bitstream format for Lattice. He's focused on re-engineering the Lattice bit file simply because he, um, they have very good documentation. One of the most difficult things with this is actually um, working out how the bit file is constructed. So, why Yosis, and what about the other tools? Well, first of all, it's open source. That means anyone can take this, expand this. They can look into it and see exactly how this works. That's very important. It's also extensible. It's not necessarily tied to one vendor. Although he's tied it to the lattice tools for the, uh, lattice chips for the moment, there are other variants being developed by other people that basically uh, connect into his work that provides support for other chips, and we'll see more and more of that coming. Uh, it's actually really small. It's not tens of gigabytes of a download. Uh, the example we're going to be using in the workshop tomorrow, if we get all the bit files written, will actually run on the Raspberry Pi. So the entire tool set for creating uh, from Verilog down to the bit file and running on the FPGA actually runs on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and it's fast. All you need is an editor and a command line, and you can just get your stuff done. Uh, Yosis was created to support these small 1 to 8,000 logic blocks, um, which will enable you to build one PICO or several PICO cores based on a RISC-V or an AVR, very small type cores. Um, they also have available to them low voltage differential signaling, which is great for accessing things like cameras, uh, digital video outputs, or very fast analog to digital signal converters and digital to analog converters. And they're very low power, these lattice chips. They're very good. They're actually used primarily in mobile markets. They're in telephones for flashing LEDs in a nice Apple-like way in many cases. Um, they're available in CSP and BGA, 
Those are pretty difficult packages to work with, particularly the CSP, they are tiny. But they are also available in QFPs, and some of them are available in QFNs as well. So it's actually handleable, you know, by hobbyists uh, and people like ourselves. And they're relatively low cost, they're five to ten dollars a piece. Um, so what would you use an FPGA to make if you're getting into them? Uh, some of the popular applications are things like vintage games consoles and emulation. These are ideal for recreating something like a Z80, a Commodore 64, or um, some, you know, odd thing that you just cannot buy anymore, but you like to emulate. Um, LED arrays, video and graphics, they're great for producing stuff that's really fast and parallel. Whether that's LED arrays, or just outputting raw VGA or DVI. Uh, they're also really good for doing complex multiple audio channels. So if you want to actually produce uh, multi-track audio with DSP effects, echoes, that kind of thing, they're great for doing it. Uh, Real-time digital signal processing and ADC, that can be used in lots of different areas uh, for control uh, and robotics. Uh, Pico RISC V is a very up-and-coming design, a completely open design of a uh, core, including all instructions, that is completely open. And uh, you can run those in these lattice chips in their smaller Pico variants. Or you could, for example, model a 300 neuron worm, which is something that I'm doing some work on, just because I can. Here you'll see some examples. Down there we've got the eye stick on the left-hand side. That's available for about $25, $20. Uh, there's a more, the larger chip down here, the 8K version. Uh, there's Clifford and Edmunds um, ICO board, which is a Pi daughter board as well. Um, Yosis can also target other chips. I mentioned this briefly. Uh, Siligo Green Pack is a very small FPGA. Um, they're about 50 cents each. They're like CPLDs. And then you've got larger Xilinx Series 7s. But we can't target the bit files. You still have to install their bit file tiles. Even though you can use Yosis to create, create the HDL from the Verilog, you have to use their tiles to put the bit file on. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. We can talk about some of that at a workshop tomorrow. Um, so Yosis is, has been likened to be the GCC of hardware. So if we look at what GCC enabled, GCC and Binutils enabled Linux, um, Yosis is going to enable all sorts of different possibilities, open source chips, and all sorts of new processing ideas, etc. It's a very exciting time. So what happens next? What do I work on next, given this? Well, the most affordable open source hardware, an FPGA development platform. At OSHOG 49 uh, in May, uh, I did an FPGA talk. I met with Ken afterwards in the pub and we decided we should put a board together that could be used along with the Yosis tools in order for people to actually start do it, developing on FPGAs in a simple way. Um, in June, after Ken passed the start of the design over to me, I worked on the schematics and the CAD. Uh, Ken went off and did his UK tour with Toby. In July, after experimenting with different layouts and functions, we settled on an STM32 uh, ARM chip, which would help program the lattice instead of the FTDI chip, but we can also run programs on that as well, so it's useful, it's like having an, uh, an Arduino built in. And we included the maximum connect connectivity we could, which includes Arduino, Shield type compatibility. We've got a Raspberry Pi header, so we can interact with a Raspberry Pi. And we've got PMODs for the FPGA and for rapid development. PMODs allow modular type development. They're small pieces uh, that can be added on. They're very simple to actually make and design, which makes it good for the development system. And in August, we prototyped three in the UK. And then we um, started manufacturing 50 via Toby in China, in Shenzhen, which arrived this week. And there is the puppy. Um, this is what we're going to be using tomorrow in the workshop for those of you attending. Uh, just a quick show around here. The ones on the outside, the connectors on the outside are PMODs. They're available in a single PMOD format, which is 
four one-bit ports and then two power lines, or in a double where you've got two lots of that. So you've got four bit ports, two power, and then another four bits above that, another two bit power. It's kind of a Goldilocks size in terms of interfacing. It makes a nice size card. So now we can work together on all of these kind of interesting things and make it all open source and available for everyone so that we can all benefit. We can make accelerators. This is a very popular way of packaging up some FPGA functionality, wrapping an API around it that can be talked to from the STM32 or from the Raspberry Pi, called from Python or from C languages. Dynamic processing, and that's the ability to reorganize the FPGA depending on what sort of jobs running on the system at a time. And we see a lot of work in that sort of area. Innovative cores and arrays. Um, what, what you see is things like fourth engines. So rather than actually designing a core that runs instructions, you design a core that runs forth straight out of the box. And we've got some good examples of that. Uh, perhaps Ken might show us a bit of that tomorrow. Uh, if we get time at the end of the workshop, we've got some examples. Um, digital signal processing, which I mentioned earlier. High-speed video and audio. Uh, Software-defined radio is another good area for FPGA uh, work. Motion prediction and control is very important in the robotics market, and you need very fast processing for this. We're seeing a lot of this being run on FPGAs now rather than just algorithms. Um, Hard-coded hardware uh, PIDs, process control algorithms that are very fast and responsive uh, for fast motor loops, for example. And then one of the other things I think we're going to see a lot more of and stuff that I'm working on are what I call the NTMs, neural Turing machines, which are uh, more fuzzy processing engines that can complement the uh, harder algorithms running on the microcontrollers and processors. Now, all this helps me and my friends make better uh, robots. Any questions? <laughs>